All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to be continuing. We are in Mark chapter two, um, and we're going to be doing part two of the story regarding the paralyzed uh, man being healed. So in our last study, in the first couple of verses, opening to chapter two, we see Jesus. He's returning to Capernaum. Uh, he's been off and away preaching in other places, uh, but he's returning to Capernaum. And when he gets there, he's met with this incredible crowd and he's at home. However, the people have come and they're packed in. Uh, there's no room around the door. Um, and he is just there speaking the word, he's speaking the word to these people. Uh, and then there are four gentlemen who come uh, bringing their paralyzed friend. Uh, so in where we ended, we ended on verse four, and today we're going to pick up in verse five. We're going to see, we see the amazing, the amazing faith and endurance of the paralyzed uh, of this paralyzed man's friend. We, we get to see that, and we talked about uh, some of that in our last Bible study. We talked about the core themes found in this in, in this gospel, and it centers around his authority. Uh, the importance that has been placed on on faith, and then to see Christ in His compassion for suffering humanity, we get to see that in in the miracles that are are, are being done here. And so today we will conclude this episode by examining Christ's pronouncements to the man, uh, coupled with the charge of blasphemy by the experts in the law uh, who are in the audience, because you know the experts are in the audience all the time. Uh, and so those are the lawyers of those times, the, the, the scribes. Uh, and we're going to see the public's response also uh, when this man is healed. But there's something else that's going to happen that we talked about last time, or rather that I read last time. Uh, and Christ is going to forgive his sins. So I'm going to reread uh, the entire account again, just so we can have the full context. When Jesus came back to Capernaum a few days later, it was heard that he was home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer space, not even near the door. And, and, and he was speaking the word to them. And some came bringing uh, to him a paralyzed man that was being carried by four men. And when they were unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof uh, above him. And after digging and opening, they let down the pallet uh, on which the paralyzed man was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, but some of the scribes were sitting there and thinking it over in their heart. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware of in his spirit that, that they were thinking these things within themselves, said to them, why are you thinking about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out of the sight of er in, in the sight of everyone, so that uh, they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. And then he went out again to the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. Um, and he was teaching. He was going out doing his ministry by the seashore. Maybe the house got a little crowded. So in verse five, we see Christ's response uh, to the faithful deeds done by the friend. And, and, and it says again, and Jesus seeing their faith said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is something that I didn't write, but this is something that just kind of like came to me right now as I'm speaking. Uh, this man, his, his sins were forgiven because of the faith of his friends. It's not to say that the man himself did not have faith, of course, uh, but, but Christ is seeing the work of his faithful friends. And so his sins were forgiven because of that. So Christ responds to the faithful deed done by the friends. He says, your sins are forgiven. And so this is something, this is unsettling. People are like, what? Certainly the scribes are like, what? 
Nobody thought that would be the response. We literally have to set aside uh, the knowledge that we have uh, come to understand about Christ if we are uh, to experience him the way the first believers experience him. So we have an understanding that we've because we've been in church likely throughout our entire lives. We've heard the stories we've heard. Uh, we've half heartedly read the scripture ourselves uh, or, or we rely on the uh, we rely so heavily on the excerpts that we hear in church um, that we never read the book to understand this context of what is being said right here. So this would have been something. Uh, totally not normal. That he said to this man, your sins are forgiven. It would have been totally unknown. I know we, we hear stories and we become so familiar with them uh, that we kind of, we lack the appropriate emotional responses. We, we get more emotional watching things like Twilight or, or whichever one of these cult favorite movies that are out here today. Um, but we need to understand background information. Uh, and when we get background information, we can see the scripture in a new light, this would have been a big deal. Christ just said, your sins are forgiven. And the experts are like, hold up. Um, they are likely, they came here probably because they're, they're, they're hearing all this, the hoopla about the new guy, the new teacher on the block. And he's getting a whole lot of attention. There may be some jealousy mixed in here. And combine that with that, they haven't had this experience throughout their whole teaching journey, throughout their whole ministry or however that worked. They haven't had this experience. Why else are they there? Surely they know the law. So why are they there? They're in a meeting, likely waiting for him to slip up. Some of them, of course, come away changed themselves, I'm sure. But for the most part, they're here with their arms crossed, looking around, you know, checking out the scene, trying to see what's going on here. You know, what is happening here? Where are all our people gone? That may be what's happening. No one is at church. <laughs> they're all over this man's house hearing this new authoritative way of speaking, this new authority. Uh, he's coming. He's speaking to them in ways that they've never heard. And of course, they are in the building. They're trying to see what's going on. Uh, I have to stop here and say people who, who study scripture faithfully can often be characterized also in the way that the scribes are characterized because uh, because of this portion of scripture and other portion of scripture. I want to encourage you uh, to not be discouraged and to continue to study to show yourself approved. Oftentimes, false prophets will try to bash people who study the scripture because if you study the scripture, then you know they're false. And it's just that. If you actually read this book, you will understand that what they're telling you is not true. A true shepherd will never complain when challenged. If they are being challenged about the word of God, they will rise to the occasion. That said, be very careful not to become a legalist. Don't become a legalist and think that you yourself have gleaned all knowledge and know all things. All errors are, are not purposeful, even if you find a pastor in error. You know, you have those people who sit in the pew and, and uh, the pastor may have meant to say Mark and he said Paul. And they're like, see there. Did you hear that? You hear that? He got that wrong. Don't become that person. Don't become that per person, please. Uh, what you are to do if you, when you study your scripture, when you study your scripture and when you know your Bible, you're going to know when you're in the presence of heresy. The Holy Spirit, if you stay in that word, you're going to know when you're in the, in the presence of, of heresy. But to those people who are new to the word and are, you know, trying to get it just down packed, uh, look for those things that seem out of place. That's the whole purpose of this channel, to encourage people to read their scripture, to read their word, be like the Bereans. That's, that's, the, that's the name, Berean disciple, be like the Berean, be those who study the scripture to see if what they have heard is so. But you can look for patterns. A, a heretical teacher is, is it's not just a heretical teacher one Sunday a year. They, they generally stick to it. Um, 
And if you find a problem in the scripture, if you see some sort of pattern and speak with your with your pastor, what I don't want people to do is become uh, connoisseurs uh, of churches going about tasting this and tasting it because then you're looking for something else and you're not looking for necessarily a presentation of the word. You're looking for something that suits your taste and you're not necessarily going there to deal with the tenets uh, of scripture and you want to be people who are not traveling about trying to find uh, the church that suits what what you your desires your fleshly desires that's not what you should be doing okay because there's a, a prevalence of false prophets we can be uh lured uh into harsh criticism and so you want to be sure that you are sure talk to other people make sure you know it, it's all about learning together we we should not be people who are seeking to dismantle uh churches uh just off the basis of personal feelings or personal convictions or personal thoughts or your taste uh you should not be doing those things you should not go in to try to dismantle uh dismantle the church singularly without going to and presenting your problems as a family and many people have had horrible experiences in family and they think that the way they deal with their own family is the way that they should go to church and deal with their church family but we should be learning to be at christ-like we should we should be exhibiting christ-like behavior and learning to work with one another right the scribes, however, did not know who they were dealing with. They they had no clue who they were dealing with. They thought this is just another man. And when they're listening to him, he's blaspheming, knowing their hearts. Jesus, um, he, he spoke directly to what they were thinking because he knew it. And he openly stated, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Thinking things in your heart means to ponder or question yourself over something that's taking place around you or just, just in general. The heart refers to the center of your thinking, uh, intellect, uh, that place that touches emotions. Sometimes they go hand in hand uh, with your emotion. Other times uh, they're mixed in, you know, with your emotions. And sometimes our intellect is being completely led by our emotions, and that is very dangerous. When we look around, we see a group of people who are oftentimes being led to say and to act and to think a certain way because of their emotions. It's a very, very dangerous thing to behold. Just look around. What we should take away from this portion of scripture is that God is well aware of those thoughts that we think are hidden. He is not like the person sitting next to you in the pew or behind you. The one who you can pretend for. No, he knows the heart. And Christ goes after those thoughts that were going on in the heart. Uh, the contents of the scribe's heart leveled a severe allegation at Christ. What they were thinking is a severe allegation it's blasphemy they're thinking that, oh well this person is he's committing blasphemy so where would they have arisen from so they they're they're the lawyers of their day they're they're the experts of their day this is referring to their knowledge of old testament scripture and how uh what the old testament scripture says they have a a grasp a hold on it Right. According to. And so they would have known that according to the book of Leviticus, the penalty for blasphemy was stoning. This is why this is a very severe uh, allegation. The Mishnah defines blasphemy as narrow as pronouncing the divine name. The Mishnah is an authoritative collection of exegetical material embodying the oral tradition of Jewish law and forming the first part of the Talmud. So this is this is this is their holy books, right? It's a narrow definition to the term blasphemy. Saying the name of God is blasphemy. They didn't. Uh, they did allow the penalty for uh, broader offenses. Indeed, attempting to co-opt God's role, uh, or, or you know, take over the prerogatives that are only given to God uh, in this instance. That forgiving sin would qualify for stoning. That would have been an appropriate sentence. 
Although we we know how they go forward, they go forward and they go forward, uh, and and with the Roman uh, punishment of crucifixion. So according to the commentary, Christ he levels uh, at them a rabbinic style lesser to greater argument. That's what we see taking place in this portion of scripture. And I'm going to read it for uh, I'm going to read it for you again. Immediately, Jesus aware in his spirit uh, that they uh, that they were thinking that way within themselves said to them why are you thinking about these things in your heart which is easier to say to to the paralyzed man your sins are forgiven or to say get up and pick up your pallet and walk so that's that greater or lesser uh the lesser to greater argument he says it is easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up pick up your bed and walk is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up, pick up your bed and walk? The point is to say, get up, pick up your bed and walk. It requires proof, right? That To say that to someone requires proof. Not today. We take on all of the false claims of miracles and we don't require any proof. Um, it can be just a sympathetic nervous system change in the moment. Uh, the fight or flight uh, symptoms where you have all this energy and you can't feel that nothing has changed. Uh, but we don't require that today. Christ is saying that a statement like get up, pick up your bed and, and walk, it requires proof. Therefore, the miracle is far more complex. And this is irony, right? This is definitely an ironic place to be in. Yet they are scoffing at him for giving this man sin. And there's a double irony in here because the irony here is forgiveness of sin is something much more complicated to do. So there is like some double irony going on here. In the present world, it is it is much more more a much more arduous task to tell someone uh, who is paralyzed to get up, pick up your bed, and walk. It requires proof. I get that. I'm thinking through this right now. So it requires proof. However, it's much more complicated when we think about forgiving sins. Think about it. Think about forgiving someone who's wronged you. Think about how we battle, we wrestle, oftentimes never making it to a place where we actually Forgive for years. Jesus is saying here, miracles are easy to say, but they require proof. Forgiveness, however, is hard to do. And Jesus will ultimately, he will go far beyond just forgiveness. He will go, he will, he will go beyond forgiveness. He gives his life to bring about that forgiveness and give us the ability to forgive. Healing a, a paralyzed man is small when compared to restoring humanity and creation to a right relationship with God. He takes this further and further. But he, just, he doesn't just ask them the question. He's not finished. He's still not finished. To show that he has complete authority, not just to forgive sin. He tells the man, pick up your bed, walk, go home. And I'm blown away when I'm reading this. I'm like, because that's a big flex. That's a, that's a big deal. So he silences the scribes. They see him. They know. He calls himself in the scripture. Let me make sure he calls himself uh, in, this, in this portion of scripture. He says, but so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Pick up your bed. Tells the par paralyzed man, pick up your bed and go home. And the paralyzed man was like, I'm out. You know, look, I'm going. This man gets up, grabs the bed and he leaves. Notice there's no delay. 
Notice God doesn't say to man, oh, you, you know, you don't have enough faith. He doesn't say any of that. So when we get in these situations where we see the faith healers and nothing happens and then all of a sudden it's you, you didn't have enough faith. This is something for us to think about when we're thinking about what we see taking place in the world today. It was immediate. He got up, picked up his bed and he left. His friends are overjoyed, I know, because they knew something about this man. Everybody's sitting around with their mouth closed, but the the scribes take up the disposition of the Pharaoh. Maybe someone there, you know, they, they look and they're like, they're wild. But many of them, likely, many of them had a hard heart. Felt outdone. Who is this person? I've been here doing all of this and this and he's coming in and he's, you know, who is this? Everybody is standing there with their mouth open, admitting, because that's that's the response of the crowd. They're admitting we have never seen anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. It says in verse 11, I say to you, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out of the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed. In their amazement, they glorified God. Their amazing, their amazement was worship. They were in awe. We've never seen anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. And this episode ends with him going to the sea to continue to teach. The problem's a little cramped in the house. I don't know if we need anybody else climbing through the roof uh, of the house. And maybe the homeowner was like, okay, Jesus, you got to take him down by the seashore. It's a lot more room down there. I don't know. Uh, we should note the blindness and the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. When we see the people today, uh, you know, professing things that are not so, we should see the blindness and the hypocrisy, even of these people who are willfully, in many instances, leading people astray. Many of them, it's not purposeful. Uh, But many of them are hypocrites. These traits will uh, cause them to deny their need for Christ in the next episode. We're going to see in our in our next study where the scribes are going to uh, the experts of that time. They're going to deny their need for for Christ. Be mindful that only the sick need a doctor. The experts stood in the way of their own healing. And what did they need to be healed from? Same thing all people need to be healed from, sin. What, is, what are we being saved from? We're being saved from the, right, the wrath we righteously deserve for being enemies of God our entire lives. Don't be so offended that you miss your opportunity to sup with the Savior. We don't want to be told anything that's true. We don't want to take heed of the word of God because we don't want to we don't want to be under the control of God. We would much rather be like the one who left, right? And took a third with him. We much rather be like Satan. This idea of self-worship, doing what we want to do in the flesh. We don't want to submit our lives to God. And we gin up this pseudo offense to rationalize us, you know, our willingness to walk away from God. We we, we want something else to blame. And that's what you're going to see here in the next episode. So you guys come back, come back and join me, please. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come thanking you, Lord. Thanking you, Lord. Worshiping you, your son and your spirit for the work that you continue to do in and through us and through those people who come into our lives, Lord God. May we not be like the experts of that day. Lord God, may we 
continue after in your word and after you, Lord God. May, may you empower us to continue our study, to continue to grow and continue to grow in obedience and sanctification. May we always remain enamored by you, by your son and by your spirit. Lord, we ask if there is any sin in our heart that you would make that apparent to us, Lord God, that you would make it clear. And by the power of your spirit, cause us to confess that sin and repent of that sin, no longer continuing in opposition to you and your word. We pray for our children, Lord God. We pray for our families near and far. We pray for the government that is over us. We pray for the hearts and minds of those people who are suffering right now. Lord God, we pray for Israel. Lord God, we pray for all of the conflicts that are popping up across the globe. And we pray that your will be done in those conflicts. These things we pray in your son's matchless name. Amen. All right, guys, please don't let the study in here. Tell me what you think. In the comment section, if you're watching me on YouTube, please like. I, YouTube likes it when you like they they push this out to other people so please 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 like share subscribe I really appreciate it you guys uh, I'll see you next time please tell someone about the goodness of Jesus Christ and read your Bible bye bye